Shadow Breakers, welcome back to Shield Breaker Presents Malifaux 101. This time, the setup. We're going to be going over um, page 71 in the pocket rule book, and it's page 59 in the large full sized rule book um, that goes over setting up a standard encounter. This is all stuff that you don't see on our normal battle reports, and it's something that I personally have seen a lot of confusion in. Specifically, at what point do you pick crew? What point do you pick schemes? What point do you go through all that process? There's a lot of set, important steps that set up the entire uh, move for the battle. So this is where we're going to go through it in detail and explain it all to you. So with that, we'll shift the camera to the table to the bird's eye view that you all have come to love and show you the process. And welcome back. Um, as you've seen here, we have displayed a board in a very unusual fashion. Uh, this is to demonstrate a very specific point. Which woman? Um, so in the past, um, I've had some discussions with people on the forums about terrain and how to determine how much terrain you have. In the rule book, it um, suggests 25 to 50 percent of the table covered, usually averaging out to about 33 percent, about a third of the table. So setting up your terrain pieces like this um, kind of helps you see how much of the table they're covering. And you want a variety of terrain pieces. You want some scatter terrain that's just there to make them go around it cause and you know not have everything be an open path um the rule book does go into different terrain traits so you want to cover some different terrain traits like we have a forest here that you know is just basically a green base with some trees on it so now it counts as a forest forests are have the dense trait which means that if you have a model on either side they cannot see each other if you have a model inside and a model outside they can see each other um, the trees also give them soft cover which we'll cover in another video and it also counts as severe terrain which um, doubles your movement requirement so if you're trying to move two inches through the forest it will now cost four inches of your movement um, ability some models do have unimpeded which directly affects that they don't care about severe terrain you can have a piece like this that can count as a basic pond that maybe you count as severe terrain, or you can make it a bog and count it as hazardous terrain, which that actually does damage to a model that ends its movement in the bog, or moves through the bog, gets placed in the bog, gets pushed into the bog. Um, it does one, two, four damage once per turn. Once you've taken damage from that terrain piece, you cannot be damaged by it again in that turn. You Fun little trick for models like Seamus with bells and lures and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, another, and L Lilith also does a um, bunch of stuff with hazardous, mostly ignoring it. Right. So if you have some hazardous terrain out there, you might want to know what your crew's abilities are in regards to it. Um, stuff like this, a big rock that can be, um, it's blocking, you can't see through it. Um, it's impassable, you cannot walk into it, whether you're in corporal or not. You cannot end your movement inside of it. Um, it's not climbable. There's no real handholds on it. But it will often, often these type of terrains will provide um, hard cover mm -hmm. if they block the, the line of sight between you and your attacking model. Well, if you, they block the line of sight, you can't shoot them in the first place. Partially block, I should Partially say. Partially blocking line of sight, which we will again go over in another video. You can have buildings like this um, that you can go inside of them. It counts as enclosed, so you have to walk in and out of the building, um, unless you're in corporal, in which case you just float through the walls. Or fly in and fly over it. Um, you have a rooftop that you can use as a vantage point, which we'll cover when we go over line of sight and such as that. Um, if you don't have a ladder or anything, you can count it as climbable. Climbing um, takes, it's like severe terrain, where it takes double your movement, so if this is a three inch building it takes six inches of movement to climb that does not get covered by unimpeded unimpeded specifies that you ignore severe terrain not climbable terrain but if you put something like a ladder or if it has stairs you could then say that it's open terrain they can easily get up there and if it has something like this ledge here you might discuss with your opponent about making that hard cover or soft cover blocking partially blocking your line of sight to get some shooting coverage up there. Wonderful. Um, also, other terrain options are like this one here. Um, as we see here, we have a, basically a mixed terrain board. We have climbable surfaces, we have hard walls, we have scattered rubble in here. 
Um, some ways you can methods you can handle this is to find the entire thing as soft cover and severe, or you can say the rubble area is severe terrain, and the uh, if the wall sections are hard cover. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can apply the traits to define this piece of terrain, and that's up for you and your opponent to discuss which ones you want to do. Um, and it's very important that you do these type of discussions before the game begins, before it becomes a game changing decision. Right. Get Discuss with your opponent what's going to happen because things like fences, you could decide that, okay, there's holes in there, you can see through it, but it's going to give soft cover. Or if it's a hard wall like this that doesn't have any holes in it, it might provide hard cover for them. Even if they're tall enough, you can see over the fencing. So it's very important to discuss that with your opponent so you both know where you stand. Or buildings like this where you have a small window in the back, you may just decide to can ignore the window and call it and consider the entire thing blocking or accept the window and use a form of true line of sight if your model is positioned in the window he can possibly see through it and then the last little piece of scatter terrain we have are small little pieces like this um, they're there for aesthetics you can define them to affect the game if you want or you can just put them on there for the sake of theming out the board or adding some flavor to the board now the rule book does discuss giving everything a height characteristic, um, rounding down. So if it's less than an inch, then it doesn't count as having any height to it. You can just walk over it, no problem. Um, so your tree, your forest, you're pretty much going to want to go with the tallest tree. That's the standard height for the whole base. Then when you're going to be placing the train, you um, each flip a card. And Nate got the higher card. So he gets to decide if he wants to place the first piece. Um, I will go ahead. Um, at this point, we can clear the board and make all the room available for terrain. All right, so Overlord gets to place the first piece of terrain. Um, I like to go with something fun in the middle, um, as a lot of scenarios uh, revolve around the center board. Um, actually, you've got the great right idea there. I'm going to take this random piece of terrain here. Uh, I'm going to set it up roughly in the middle, which is going to cause some interesting interactions in the case of a turf war or a reckoning or squatters rights or squatters rights um, I'm gonna call we're gonna call the center the 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 tile itself is gonna be severe terrain the walls will provide hard cover and then we'll make them uh, climbable to get to the upper platforms All right. and then I'm gonna place I love this piece it's a great like cemetery piece I'm just gonna place it in the corner over there all right, and what do we have here for this piece? This is a hill, so it's climbable. If you're standing on top of it, you have line of sight to things that are down below. Other than that, it's pretty basic. It's got stairs, so it's easily to easy to climb. Blocking, of course. Mm -hmm. Can't see through it. Um, scatter terrain is often about three to one is a good ratio. Um, there's nothing in the book specifying how many pieces of scatter terrain there are uh, per thing. This is something I'm stealing from Games Workshop. Kind of a good rule of thumb, um, just because that doesn't do a whole lot, but it also allows you to set up something like this if you had kind of an idea in place. Um, to which we'll call the fences uh, soft cover uh, and passable. The low wall will be hard cover and climbable at height one. This is another one of my favorite pieces. It just looks like it's been left behind. It's like a leftover piece from one of the out outer towns of Malifaux or something. So I like to put it just kind of on the edge so it looks like it used to be a building. So that's, we'll just call the whole thing blocking. Can't see through the windows because that gets a little complicated sometimes. Agreed. Fantastic. And hardcover. Okay. So that's the gist of it. We're going to go ahead and finish up the rest of the table and move on to the next step. Okay, so the next step, we are now on step two of the process. Determine encounter size. I think we, uh, the Winch Woman and I have both agreed to a 50 soul stone battle. Mm -hmm. um, quick and easy. 50 is the average battle. 35 is a very common number as well. 41 is also very popular because that is where you have to, that's the first level you have to use a master. Um, 40 or less, you can use a henchman as a leader. So some of the hard, more hardcore tournaments will use 41 points because that will make you really choose who you want to be fielding with your master. Exactly. So now that we've determined our encounter size at 50 soul stones, we announce our factions. I will be running 10 thunders. And I will be running Arcanus. Fantastic. 
Um, as you see, the rest of this stuff goes fairly quick. Next step is to uh, determine deployment. Both players shuffle their deck. One player then flips the top card of their deck and consults the relevant chart. So I got a 10. I've got a lovely diagram in the book. If I can find it. There we go. So there's the chart. And then on the next two pages, they've got a diagram of how they get set up. So 10 is a corner deployment. So we'll each have a 12 inch bubble in the corners and the center line will go diagonally across. Um, also, for those who are interested in the scheme and strategy deck that we are just released this year, it has this chart and this entire flow through as a card printed in the deck. Yes. Um, so now we've determined our deployment zones. It's not something we act on immediately, we just consider mm -hmm. it. The next step is determine the strategy. Uh, we'll have the winch woman again flip the top card of her deck. And the jack doesn't is not relevant. It's the suit that you're looking for. This the book suit, the tomes, is squatters' rights for strategies, and that particular strategy involves having markers down the center line, five markers down the center line of the board, and you're trying to claim them for your crew. Go ahead and detail to me exactly where those markers are supposed to go. Okay, one of them goes exactly in the center. All right, so 36 inch board, so 18 inches. Now the other thing to take into consideration 18 inches. Okay. is who's going to deploy on what corners because you have the, the deployments are in opposite corners and then you have the center line goes between them. So next the overlord is going to go ahead and flip two cards to determine the scheme pool. All right. So we have a 13 of crows and a nine of books. And there's a lovely chart in the book that will detail what each one does. 13 is power ritual. It's a fun one. Nine is take prisoner. Tomes is protect territory. And crow is assassinate. And then there's always a line in the sand. Fantastic. So now we have our scheme pool generated. We have mm -hmm. our strategy de determined. And it's good to note, you do not pick your schemes right now. You kind of note down which ones are available. This is also where the scheme and strategy deck comes in handy because you can just pull those cards out and not act on them yet. So you don't have to memorize what cards were flipped. Exactly. So to recap at this point, we have determined our terrain, set up our board. We have announced our factions. We have determined our strategy and our scheme pool. The next step is for us to pick and reveal our crews. Um, for the, uh, so, at that point, I have declared, I am deciding to run Misaki. The crew I have selected for this is Misaki with her totem Shang, the Dawn Serpent, a Toto, a Perator Kages, and Yamaziko. Um, upgrades I have selected. Our Misaki will be running Misdirection, Recall Training, and Stalking Basinto. Atoto will have Call the Thunder and Recall Training. And Yamaziko will also have Recall Training. It's a rare three, no restriction beyond that, beyond 10 Thunders, which allows me to have three copies of the upgrade on the field. And for my side of the table, I'm going to be fielding Marcus with Miranda and his totem, Jackalope. And I'm going to have the Slate Ridge Mauler, a pair of um, Sabertooth Kerberuses, and a pair of Razor Spine Rattlers. I do not have any upgrades in this uh, setup. It's just straight 50 points of models. Fantastic. Now that we've declared our crews, we can now go to the scheme pool and determine what schemes work best for us. And doing it in this order, allows you to tailor your scheme, your crew to what the strategy is, what the schemes are available. In a, most tournament and league settings, you only have to declare a faction and stay within that faction. So at this point, we choose our schemes. Uh, we can choose to reveal them or not. Can you go for us the scheme pool one more time, which woman? The scheme pool is um, line in the sand, which involves dropping markers down the center line, which could actually work really well in Pairing with squatters, right? Because you need to go claim those markers as well. So you're going to be along the center line anyway. Um, we have assassinate, which in just involves killing the other crew's leap master. 
leader. In this case, it'd be a master. We have protect territory, which involves dropping scheme markers and staying close to them. Yep. Um, we have take prisoner, which involves kind of claiming a enemy model and keeping them alive and having somebody within two inches of them. Engaged. Engaged with them, sorry. And then we have power ritual, which involves dropping scheme markers in the corners. That's actually one of my favorite ones to take with Marcus. Because he's got three action points, he can motor, you can drop one into your deployment zone and then motor over to the other corners and drop them off. Also an excellent one for Rasputina with the December Acolytes. Mm -hmm. They may not be able to interact turn one, but they're already in the corners turn two. Right. Uh, turn two, you can have power ritual locked up nice and tight. Um, so yeah, these are good, good times to be taking into consideration what your crew does, how you run them yourself. Excellent. So for my case, Misaki may not be the best choice for squatters' rights, but the scheme pool works pretty well in my favor. Um, I've already decided what schemes I want to do. One cannot be revealed. The other one um, can be, and uh, that will be line in the sand for me. I'm also going to reveal line in the sand. I'm also going to reveal power ritual. Fantastic. The final step is deploy crews. We both flip a card. I have a king. And I have a jack. Since I have won the flip, I get the choice. Um, I will choose to have the winch woman deploy first. Okay. At this point, we will now determine our corners as she picks the ones she wants to use. And a large chunk of my crew has unimpeded, so they don't care about the severe terrain. So I can take that into account when I choose what corner I'm going to deploy off of. I'm going to go ahead and choose this corner. So I personally just kind of measure out 12 inches from the corner and use that as a rough estimate where everything goes. So as you saw really quick, the corner deployment is a 12 inch arc from the corner. Uh, as she has selected that corner over there, I am now restricted to this corner over here. And our center line has now been determined here. Um, it's important to note at this point, as we start placing our marker, our squatter right markers, we may have to rearrange terrain mm -hmm. um, to make room for the markers, but that's okay. So a squatter's right, it's six inches from the center of the, from center to center for markers. Oops, sorry. So like here's one I need to rearrange because yes. it won't sit properly. Okay. Little, and then six inches from the center of six that Six inches one. from the corner. Well, it's, it should be six inches from on no. both ways, shouldn't it? Nope. It's oh. specified six inches from the corner because center line. So as you see, we didn't have to do a whole lot of arranging. Um, it's okay that we've placed this, placed this on top of the building. Uh, we do have access to it from the ladder. Um, clearly, it is much more accessible from her side of the board than it is from mine, but that's a very important aspect of deployment decision because um, it's very hard for me to get to that section. Uh, on the bright side, I had the Dawn Serpent who can fly, so he can get to there fairly easily. Yeah, if it was something like I was going to end up on top of here, um, you might want to take into consideration rearranging the table a little bit to mo make it not on there so that it was equal opportunity for both sides and not limited to things that could fly. Now some people will place markers um, or beads or deployment setups. Um, that's Usually all, I will. But it's all up to personal preference. And now we're ready to start our encounter. Last thing we do is shuffle all our cards back into our deck and reset. Um, and then draw hand and begin turn one. So for a detailed analysis of how a turn plays, please check out our other video, Malifo 101, The Basics. Um, thanks for watching. I'm the Overlord. And I'm Winch Woman. Breakers out. <laughs>